Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newer updated patrons, Jack E, Ramon S.A., and Michael K. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. There are a few news sources out there saying that Tesla has rolled out its first advertising try, and that's really just not the case. They're all just referencing this video that Tesla Asia tweeted out last week, and therein lies the problem. Posting from your own company Twitter account does not constitute as advertising in the truest sense of the word, especially for Tesla because they've been doing this now for years. Elon himself has said that the choir or people following accounts like this are already bought in, so advertising is to reach a new cohort of people. In fairness, Elon did say he wants Tesla's advertising to be more like content and less like advertising, but the way I see it, this is not Tesla's first ad. Here we have Bridgestone rolling out a brand new replacement tire specifically for electric vehicles and even better, actually geared for the full Tesla lineup S3XY and the Ford Mustang Mach-E, claiming improvements in the areas you would expect for an electric vehicle. Better tread life, reduced ride noise, better wet handling performance, less rolling resistance, and things of the like. This specific tire, the Taranza EV Grand Touring. So if you're in the market for a replacement tire for your Tesla or Mach-E, specifically an all season tire and so far just in North America, this may be one to add to the list. Here's the pricing, and they said other EVs will be launching early 2024. I'm always very skeptical of battery breakthroughs because at the end of the day, research is great, but the real question is, can this be entered into mass production? We'll see on this one, but the Argonne National Laboratory researchers have said they found an antifreeze electrolyte whose charging performance does not decline at minus four degrees Fahrenheit. They also discovered at the atomic level what makes it so effective. Typically in sub-zero temperatures, it's the liquid electrolyte that's responsible for transferring the ions between the electrodes, the anode and the cathode, that actually can freeze and can be what degrades the charging performance. So this research team's solution to that problem, fluorine containing solvents. Even at sub-zero temperatures, the capacity was equivalent to that of a cell with a conventional carbonate-based electrolyte at room temperature. They also said it's much safer when it comes to not catching on fire, and now they're looking for an industrial partner to adapt it to one of their designs for lithium ion batteries. I have absolutely no insight into this, but of course I would love to see Cato Road get to try out this new fluorine solvent. I saw some trending posts that Tesla's new safety score version 2.0 has rolled out, but we actually talked about this a few weeks back. I'll make sure this blog post is linked below, but I saw many people actually saying they thought the forward collision warning was now removed because there was a screenshot where it did not have this as an option anymore, but it was actually just going over some of the latest updates. So yes, the forward collision warning is still part of the Tesla safety score. They just adjusted how they calculate it. I also saw many people asking how the specific hour of the nighttime driving category actually impacts your score. So this will also be below where it's broken down in detail by the hour for the safety score version 2.0. On the FSD beta front, Elon said some easy to fix bugs addressed in 11.4.2 that starts rolling out this weekend. We'll address excess conservatism with narrow roads and with lane changes and heavy traffic. This tweet was Friday night. Just in case any of you were following the Model 3 crash at a Vancouver ferry terminal, turns out after the investigation, it was a case of driver error and not sudden unintended acceleration. Spokesperson for the police department said the investigators determined the collision to be human caused. So far, NHTSA has looked into over 200 claims of sudden unintended acceleration, but found no problems with the vehicles themselves. We got the battery energy storage market update for the month of April from Real Motion, and here are the numbers. In April, four gigawatt hours of new capacity entered operation across 44 different projects, up 75% from April of last year. So far year to date, 17.5 gigawatt hours of projects have been deployed globally, and just later this year, another 123 gigawatt hours 
is planned for completion again this year. Given the year-to-date deployments and what's planned for the rest of the year, we'll call that 140 gigawatt hours for the year. If you're new, for context, each Tesla Megapack factory has a capacity of 40 gigawatt hours, so the total global deployment for this year is only about three and a half Tesla Megapack factories. My point being, with Tesla's two announced Megapack factories and most likely another one coming in the next 12 months, Tesla has ambitions to be a major player in this market. In case you're in Canada, please be aware that the seven seat option for the Model Y has been removed from the online configurator and it says there are a limited number of seven seat interior options available in inventory. Looking at said inventory, there are only a few available and it looks like most of them are currently being offered at a discount. So if you're in the market, just a heads up. In case it wasn't official before, it's official now. The first ship bringing Model 3 and Ys from China to Canada, specifically Vancouver, arrived over the weekend, and the second ship with the same destination is in transit now. And yes, a side benefit of this is that more cars that Tesla makes in North America can actually be delivered in North America to take advantage of the IRA credits. And just to throw it out there, a Shanghai-built Model 3 or Y sold for Canadian prices even despite the logistics costs that, by the way, have come down significantly over the past six to 12 months, could be a very profitable endeavor. Speaking of new Model Y variants, we had a member of the TFF forum post some screenshots with some data about the charging curve for the new Model Y from Giga Berlin with the new BYD Blade LFP battery. Another TFF member actually put that data into this chart, which makes it much easier to understand. The red line is this new BYD 60 kilowatt hour battery, and the blue line is CATL's 62 kilowatt hour pack. Of course, this is just one anecdote from one user, but interesting nonetheless. The BYD Blade Pack held its charge just south of 175 kilowatts, all the way until 50% state of charge, and that's where it started tapering off, not linking up with the pack from CATL until about 85% state of charge. This test started at 20% state of charge, so from there until about 85%, Looks like the new BYD blade packs may actually have better charging curves. Yes, there are usually trade-offs with battery performance, so if it charges faster for longer, does that mean less cycle life for the lifetime of the battery? It's clearly too early to tell, and we know CATL isn't going to stay in the rear view for long if these are indeed consistent charging curve stats. As we've heard plenty of hype about CATL's upcoming M3P battery, which is LFMP chemical chemistry with some extra differences as well. This is exhibit A, why competition is so good for the end consumer. Today, there was an article from the Wall Street Journal talking about how Hyundai is making such big waves in the EV space and becoming a cool forward-thinking brand now. Well, their former vice president said, the Model 3 from Tesla showed the industry that the EV market was much bigger than many people thought. And he astutely pointed out, Hyundai leadership realizes the EV market is a jump ball, at least for third place and beyond behind Tesla and BYD. And Jim Farley had some glowing comments on Hyundai. He said, some software features in the Ionic 5 were better than Ford's own. And he said, that company has really found their stride with EVs. One of the biggest problems for Hyundai right now is that most of their cars are built outside North America, excluding them from IRA credits, but they do have a $5.5 billion factory planned for Georgia, but it won't open until the end of next year. Their former VP spoke on Tesla saying everybody saw they went from a niche player to a core player with one model, and people in Korea and Hyundai saw Tesla as a tech company rather than a car company. They were focused on technology and that was very appealing in Korea. So maybe it really is just the analysts that are in the clouds here in the United States that aren't giving Tesla credit for being a tech company. And don't forget what Farley said, the ones I'm paying the most attention to are Hyundai Kia, the Chinese, and Tesla. That's my list. Quote tweeting that very report, even Corey Steuben is saying they're more than a dark horse talking about Hyundai. We're nearly finished with our Ionic 5 teardown and report. I would argue they're the closest to Tesla. I'd like to show you the LinkedIn page for Prasoon C because he's currently the staff manufacturing engineer for vehicle manufacturing at Tesla. I saw Sawyer point this 
this out and Pursun said he's working on a small project that aims to automate wire harness installation in cars. Yes, it's still in the development stage, but Tesla is up to something. This is important because Elon has mentioned in the past that one of the litmus tests for robots really being on a human level is if they could do this very task, installing the wire harness. So if Tesla can be successful with this project of automation, this would not be a trivial accomplishment. The co-owner of the Babylon Bee tweeted this picture with Elon Musk, so it sounds like we'll be getting an upcoming conversation coming soon. This was a pretty cool thing for marketing for Tesla in Shanghai, where they had car owners and employee volunteers in Shanghai connecting 52 different couples for a group wedding with a special wedding fleet that, yes, was made up of 80 Tesla wedding cars. Not something I've personally ever seen here in the States. The internet is also telling me that 520 in Chinese means I love you, which is why a lot of people celebrate weddings on May 20th. Just another fun fact, community builder, we have the Tesla LinkedIn page tweeting out with a thousand employees, we took part in this year's Berlin company run and started as the largest team sharing this photo. Sometimes it's the small stuff that can go the longest way when it comes to brand building and making people feel like they're part of a team, more importantly, part of a mission that's bigger than themselves. Ford just held its Capital Markets Day and we got some new tidbits of information. First, one of its next-gen EVs planned for 2025 will be a three-row SUV with 350 miles of range that's inspired by the Ford Expedition, not an actual Ford Expedition. Ford said that would be too big and require too many batteries. One of the other biggest highlights of the event was Ford mentioning multiple new supply deals for raw materials to make batteries. Ford CFO also shared some very candid comments. He said, you're not going to believe us until we start delivering it. Ford has said these things before and they said so far they haven't delivered, so we have to prove it. We can talk about it, but we have to prove it. And then Jim Farley deploys even more candor saying, we're so far behind on waste and cost, a sentiment that he's mentioned now multiple times over the past few months. Ford also said its next-gen EV truck will have a 30% lower labor and overhead cost than its current gas-powered truck. I thought this was one of the most interesting takeaways. Ford expects sales and profit margins from its ICE division to grow for at least the next two years before the industry-wide transition to EVs starts to shrink that business. The head of Ford Blue, the ICE line, said profit margins for combustion vehicles should grow from 7.2% today to at least 10% by 2026. One that I'm not so sure I agree with, he also said Ford sees strong US ICE and hybrid sales well into the next decade. We also have Ford taking a page directly out of the Tesla playbook over the last two years, reducing orderable combinations of the Explorer and Expedition from 1900 to 23 and 800 to 32 respectively. Ford reiterated its goal for 8% margins on EVs by 2026. So Ford has talked a lot about how it plans to close the gap with Tesla. Now we just watch and see if they can execute on that plan. A quick update on Panasonic and its future plans to build 4680 cells in North America by 2030. They had talked about two new factories, but they have yet to decide where exactly in North America it will expand. It could be Nevada, where they're already set up with Tesla. It could be Kansas, where they're already set up or building a factory there now for 2170 cells, or it could be somewhere else. We had just reported that Panasonic delayed the commercial production of its 4680 test line in Japan, basically for one year. So given that news, it's really no surprise that they don't yet know where they would want a dedicated 4680 line in North America. The good news, it's still coming at some point. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLumis22. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.